Uh, he's a publisher of uh, Heyday Books. You can look them up online and uh, see the impressive uh, uh, website and works that uh, he's published over the 25 years or so on uh, all in California, California nature, culture, art, and so on. Uh, he's also an author, and we're bringing him here partly in that capacity, or mostly in that capacity, uh, to talk specifically about uh, his thoughts on research. Uh, he wrote two books, one of the, which is a standard famous uh, a uh, California book was uh, nominated or named as one of the 100 best books on California a few years ago called The Ohlone Way about uh, Ohlone Indians. So, uh, and that was all from research. So he's going to talk about research today. So if you'd welcome Malcolm Margolin. Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Hey, listen, I'm really sorry and embarrassed for being late. I thought an hour and a half from Berkeley to here would be enough, and uh, the traffic had other ideas. Uh, so forgive me. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, I am going to talk about research, and I'm going to talk about, because that's what Doug asked me to talk about. And I'm going to talk about the Ohlone Way. And I wrote the Ohlone Way some 30 years ago. It was published in 1978. And this was a world before, this was the dark ages. I mean, this was the world before computers. This was the world before, it, it, even, even photocopy machines were new. And I researched in a very peculiar way. And, and when you research stuff, you ended up reading something called books. You ended up going through newspapers. You ended up wandering around libraries. You, wondered, you, you, you did a lot of asking of questions of people. Uh, because knowledge was in people's minds as to where you find something. Have you read anything good? And you go around asking people, and then you ended up taking notes, writing out notes. And in that time when you did a manuscript, you did it on a typewriter uh, with whiteout. And, uh, and if you wanted to send somebody a copy, you made carbon papers. You made, you made carbon copies. And the, the, the world has changed, and I'm going to talk about how I did research in that old world. And I do not for one moment expect that anybody is going to have a conversionary experience, that you're going to throw away your computers, that you're going to get, type, you're going to get manual typewriters and carbon paper and white out. Uh, and maybe what you'll find is that what I have to say is odd and quaint and I hope amusing. Uh, but I think there is in that something that is interesting and something that perhaps can be used and something that perhaps your wonderful limbum figure out how to adapt it to this modern age in which we live. Uh, the um, one thing that I learned about research and one thing that I've learned about writing is that you have to put your whole self into it. There's something about standing aside from the material and taking facts from one place and moving them to another place and standing aloof from it all that I think leads to some spectacular mistakes and some spectacularly missed opportunities. And I think putting yourself into it means putting your whole self into it. I, know, I remember there was a friend of mine, a, a wonderful friend, who probably has the liveliest mind of anybody that I know. Uh, I get together with him and ideas just bounce and they're playful and they're joyful and he's got spectacular insights into life. Uh, and his writing is probably the dullest writing that I've ever seen of any human being. Uh, I was always stunned by that paradox as to how somebody that you, you, you end up having a beer with this guy and uh, it's, it's like a badminton game. I mean, you just kind of whack the birdie over and then something spectacular comes back and you whack it back. And uh, it, 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 it's, it's so alive and so vibrant and so joyful. And then when he writes, it's so dull. Uh, and I once was, uh, came upon him when he was writing. He was sitting at a computer and he was writing. And I realized his whole body language had changed. That he thought that in order to write, in order to research, he had to be a different person than the one he was when he was in friendships. And uh, there, there was something about that that he was not putting into the writing, he was not putting into the research, the same vibrancy that he puts into the rest of his life, but it was somehow or other he was viewing it as something else, as you had to be somebody different from who you were. You, yeah, you, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit clumsy on this because I've spent the last hour and a half thinking about how late I was. 
Uh, <laughs> so I haven't been thinking about what I would say. Um, uh, we once started, we do a lot of California Indian publishing, and we once started a um, master apprentice program for languages that, Indian languages that are down to their last few speakers. And we ended up pairing off older Indians that still spoke a wonderful language like Yurok or Yolumni or uh, Kachan or some of these other, Kawiya, some of these other languages. And we paired them off with younger people. And we ended up getting into how people learn languages. And one of the most successful ways of learning language is to learn it with your body as well as with your mind. Uh, that if you, somebody, the word for hello is hello. They may or they may not learn it. If you tell them the word is hello, and you just put in your whole body, then it becomes learning it better. And the more of yourself you put into the research, the better off you are. Uh, I began each day when I was writing The Ohlone Way. I, I thought it was going to take me six months, and it took three years. Uh, and I, I never would have started it if I thought it was going to take three years. Uh, and I'm so glad that I did. I mean, that um, there was a whole lot to understand, and there was a whole lot to think about, and there was a whole lot to learn, and the material was very difficult. But I began each day by entering into the material, by entering into the research. And I would do it by uh, a very methodical, I, I, would, I would do it almost ritually, uh, that there was an early, the first expedition to the Bay Area was the Portola Expedition, uh, 1769. And I would pretend that I was on that expedition, that I was following these first Spaniards that came through Indian territory. And I would follow them up, and I would follow them up from the Mexican border through San Diego, through Los Angeles, through Santa Barbara, over the mountains, over up toward the Big Sur area, or across into the Salinas Valley, and up through the Salinas Valley. And I would picture that journey coming to the Bay Area. I would visualize myself walking behind those mules uh, and then I would picture how they came into the Santa Cruz area, for example, and they were so stunned by redwood trees. I mean, they had never seen any tree. They, could, they, they couldn't understand what kind of tree this was. And they were trying to measure it with their muskets. And they came upon animals that they couldn't quite describe. They, they, they looked like a combination of a deer and a cow. And it turned out to be herds of elk that they were coming. And they came upon an Indian village in the Pajaro River uh, where there was a pole. And on the pole was an effigy, a, a, a stuffed animal. And they pulled it down, and it was a bird. And they spread out its wings. And it had a 13-foot a wingspan. And it was a condor. And I just picture myself coming with them through these worlds of miracles, through these worlds of things never seen. And then this expedition, they were looking for Monterey Bay. And uh, they had passed Monterey Bay. Their, their, their uh, maps were faulty. And they had passed Monterey Bay. And they um, were coming up the peninsula. And they came to uh, Pacifica, where Pacifica is today. And there was an Indian village, Protostock. And they stopped at Protostock because there they could see the Farallon Islands. And they could take sightings from the Farallon Islands. Uh, and they went up, in a, and they sent this guy, Sergeant Ortega, up to hunt them. And he went up into the hills to hunt deer. And in a wonderful story, he comes to the brink of the hills, uh, to the top of the hills, up where Crystal Springs Reservoir, Sweeney Ridge, is today. And he looks down, and he sees San Francisco Bay spread out before him. And no European, no outsider had ever seen San Francisco Bay. And he just talks about this immense brazo del mar, this immense arm of the sea that was out there. And he looks down, and he looks down toward the Santa Clara Valley, and he looks down toward this wonderful savanna that dotted with oak trees, with Guadalupe Creek and Coyote Creek, and the fire of little Indian villages coming up. And he looks at the big Elviso marshes, and he wonders, and he just marvels at what this is, and he goes back down to Pacifica. Uh, I would start the research by staying up on that ridge and imagining myself coming down into the bay in those first, to, be, to be the first outsider, the first white person, the first European, sees this area and what I would see. And whenever I did any research, I would do it from the perspective, not of an outsider, but from the perspective of somebody that was now in the bay, 
somebody that was coming in as a part of this expedition, and I would gather material around this vision. And if I came upon any piece of material whatsoever, I would think about where it was. If somebody said something like, this is how Indians made arrows and bows, I would not just take and write down, this is, where in, this is how Indians made bows and arrows. I would think about where that bow and arrow was, where it would be in the village, where it would be situated, who would be holding it. Would they be holding it in their left hand? Would they be holding it in their right hand? I would really work that material as best I could. And the material that I gathered to uh, do this research came from a variety of sources. It came from anthropological records. It came from article digs. It came from hi county histories. It came from newspapers. It came from unpublished archives. It came from talking to people. Uh, if I, um, uh, it, it, it came from old newspaper accounts. It came from the from Ohlone Indians themselves. And if I couldn't find anything about the Ohlones who lived in the San Francisco Bay Area to Monterey, I would research the people that lived around them to see what other people were doing. And if people in the Pomo to the north were doing something, and the Salinans to the south were doing something, and the Yokuts to the east were doing something, it was a fairly good conjecture that perhaps the Ohlones were doing it too. And you could say this as long as you shaded it, as long as you'd said, they very likely did this, then you could kind of use that ambivalent sort of information. I then took that information and back at that time uh, in that pre-computer age you had scraps of paper. Your, your life was filled with scraps of paper. And I would end up having notes and I would end up having Xeroxes of things and I would end up having articles that I clipped out. And, I, and, it, and the damn thing looked like a hamster cage. Uh, the, uh, it, it, I, I'd be off in, uh, in, in a restaurant, and I'd be thinking about something, and an idea would come to me, and I'd write it down on a napkin. And the process of sorting it out was to put it into envelopes. So I'd have an envelope marked housing, or I'd have an envelope marked marriage, or I'd have an envelope marked birth, or I'd have an envelope marked hunting. And then I would put these scraps of paper into this envelope. And an example of the uh, kinds of things that I would come upon was here was something, and, and I'll give a couple of examples of what I came upon, and then I'll talk about how I used them and how I used the imagination to work on them. Uh, this was uh, uh, Francisco Guadalupe de la Perouse. He was uh, clearly a Frenchman. Uh, he uh, was in 1760, in 1786, he came into Monterey Bay uh, and stopped in at the Carmel Mission and took notes and visited the uh, Indians that were living there that had been missionized. Uh, and he left a wonderful journal. And he talks about the hunting. He says, these Indians are extremely skillful with the bow and killed the, before us the smallest birds. Their patience in approaching them is inexpressible. They conceal themselves and slide in a manner after their game, seldom shooting until within 15 paces. Their industry in hunting larger animals is still more admirable. We saw an Indian with a stag's head fastened on, walking on all fours and pretending to graze. He played this pantomime with such fidelity that our hunters, when within 30 paces, would have fired at him if they had not been forewarned. In this manner, they approach a herd of deer within a short distance and kill them with their arrows. So this was a wonderful description of a hunter. Later on, there's some descriptions of houses. Uh, the Indian village stands on the right, and this is the right of the mission, consisting of about 50 huts which serve for 740 persons of both sexes, including their children. Um, these huts are round and about six feet in diameter and four in height. Some stakes the thickness of a man's arm stuck in the ground and meeting at the top compose the framing. Eight or ten bundles of straw are the only defense against rain or wind, and when the weather is fine, more than half the hut remains on with a precaution of two or three bundles of straw to each habitation to be used as circumstances may require. So this was a description of houses that I came upon, and the 
hunting description went into the hunting envelope and the housing description went into the housing envelope. I then took and started working out, I, 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 and, I, and I researched, without, without writing, I researched for probably a year and a half. Uh, and it was a matter of getting little scraps, there. these little scraps of information began to compile, began to pile up. And finally I would take these envelopes and I would empty them out and I would arrange them. And from that arrangement I created a description of what San Francisco Bay was like and what Indian life was like. Uh, the thing that most amazed me, by the way, was the environment of San Francisco Bay. I mean, that La Perouse expedition, he talks about the coast in, in, in September of 1786 and being surrounded by so many whales that within a half a pistol shot of the boat you could have seen a whale spouting. And he talks about the air being thick with the stench of the spoutings of the whales. And then the uh, other people would talk about coming into San Francisco Bay and the runs of smelt and herring that were coming into the bay running 20 days at a time, just the whole water flashing with silver. And they would talk about the seabirds wheeling and gyring in the air and swooping down and scooping them up. Uh, and and, and the, the big runs of salmon, the uh, coho salmon that came up all the little creeks and the king salmon that went into the Sacramento River. And these salmon running through uh, the Golden Gate and around Angel Island and up through San Pablo Bay and up into the Carquina Straits. And everybody, I, I came upon this description about 10 times, as everybody that crossed the Carquina Strait at certain times of the year said that the, it looked so thick with salmon that it, that, that it looked as if you could walk across the straits on the backs of the salmon. Uh, and then these grand marshes that were around here that were the great heritage of the South Bay, the Alviso marshes were the largest marshes in the Pacific Flyway. And in the fall, you'd end up having flocks of geese and ducks would come in. And they talk about how they would come in and darken the sky with their numbers. And when you came in and made a sudden noise, how they would rise up with a sound like that of a hurricane. And these hills around here, there was a lot of grassland and it was an open savanna uh, dotted with oaks. And along the creeks, along Guadalupe and Coyote Creek, you'd have thick growths of uh, riparian vegetation. But the rest of it was open meadowland that had been repeatedly burned by the Indians. And it was grazed with animals. You'd end up having pronghorn antelope were running two or three hundred to a herd. Uh, and uh, the tule elk and the grizzly bears along the streams and the eagles. And it was something that just came pouring out of these envelopes with these various descriptions. Um, I then, went, after the environment, I talk about the uh, daily life of California Indians, of Indians in the Bay Area. And um, and I talk about the deer hunter, uh, and I'll skip the part in which he uh, goes into the sweat house in which he smokes tobacco, in which he fasts, in which he um, uh, prepares himself, he stays away from women, uh, he dreams, he sings power songs. Uh, and, and, and hunting is in some ways a very brutal act. I mean, you go out and you kill something and it's kind of messy and brutal. Uh, but it was done with a kind of elegance and a kind of restraint and a kind of beauty that you can't really deny or contradict. The hunt itself is a splendid sight. The hunter, often with a companion or two, his body painted, his bow and arrows properly treated, lean, hungry, alert, connected with the dream world, his mind secure that he has followed all the proper rituals, approaches a herd of grazing deer. He wears a deer head mask, perhaps an amulet hangs from his neck. He moves toward the grazing ground slowly, almost diffidently, in many ways more like a suitor than a potential conqueror. As soon as he sights a herd of deer, he crouches low and begins to move like a deer. Uh, he played the pantomime to such perfection, noted a French sea captain who witnessed one such hunt. All our own hunters would have fired at him at 30 paces had they not been prevented. Um, I then talk about a couple of different strategies. The third strategy is for the hunter to move closer to the herd, indeed to become part of the very herd he is hunting. 
The hunter crouches down and drags himself along the ground, little by little, with his left hand. In his right hand, he carries a bow and a few arrows. He lowers and raises his head so as to imitate the motions of a deer. The herd catches sight of him. The deer perk up their ears and strain their necks to get a better view. Suddenly they toss their heads, and with wide-eyed terror they bound away. The hunter, too, tosses his head and bounds after them. They stop and he stops. They run and he runs. The hunter seems almost to be dancing with the herd. Gradually the deer feels soothed, and if the hunter has properly prepared himself, the herd accepts him. They push their noses into the cool green grass that easily moves among them. When it comes time to release his arrow, the hunter is often so close that, according to one description, he can nudge the deer into a better position with his bow. He shoots and the arrow hits silently, the deer collapses. The others look about confused, another arrow is released, the second deer falls, and now the herd bolts wildly up the hill. What is the hunter thinking about as he moves closer to the herd of deer? There is an intriguing suggestion by J. Alden Mason, an anthropologist who studied the Salinans just to the south of the Ohlones. Writes Mason, the hunter always chewed tobacco assiduously while approaching the game, as this tended to make it drunk and less wary. Chewing the strong native tobacco undoubtedly affected the hunter's mind. But why, by altering his own consciousness, should the hunter think he was making the deer drunk and less wary? To understand this, to understand the subtle ways in which the hunter felt that his mind was linked to the mind of a prey, whose nature and intelligence were not very different from his own, is to glimpse some of the drama and spiritual complexity of deer hunting as it was practiced by the Indians of California. Um, so how did I get from uh, a scattered doggy bag of notes to what seems like a full-fledged description as if, I were, as if I were almost there, as if I were almost witnessing it? Well, one of it was psychological. One of it is, once again, to put yourself into that world rather than stand aside from it and move papers from, or, or move information from one source to another source, to actually filter that information. Uh, the um, other bit is, I'll have to do this rather quickly, uh, but another thing is to interact, to wrestle with your data, uh, not just to accept the data as it is, but to get in there and wrestle with it and to squeeze every single bit of juice you can out of it all. Uh, I brought as an example uh, a Wintu Indian prayer. And um, I'll just read it quickly, and I'll just talk about a few of the things that you can squeeze out of this, that if you just take it as face value, you have simply a prayer. If you start manipulating it, if you get into the middle of it, if you start exploring it, if you think deeply about it, then other things begin to emerge. And this was an old man's prayer uh, that his daughter, Sadie Marsh, heard him say in the old days. Uh, and it's a prayer to Olelbus, who was the winter world god. Olelbus, look down on me. I wash my face in water for you, seeking to remain in health. I am advancing in old age. I am not capable of anything anymore. You whose nature it is to be eaten, and this was a way of addressing deer, a polite way of addressing the deer. You whose nature it is to be eaten, you dwell high in the west on the mountain, high in the east, high in the north, high in the south. You, salmon, you go about in the water, yet I can't kill you and bring you home. Neither can I go east down the slope to fetch you, salmon. When a man is so advanced in age, he is not in full vigor. If you are rock, look at me. I am advancing in old age. If you are tree, look at me. I am advancing in old age. If you are water, look at me. I am advancing in old age. Acorns, I can never climb up to you again. You, water, I can never dip you up and fetch you home again. My legs are advancing in weakness. Sugar pine, you, sir, I can never climb you. In my northward arm, in my southward arm, I am advancing in weakness. If you are wood, you, wood, I cannot carry you home on my shoulder, for I am falling back into my cradle. This is what my ancestors told me yesterday, they who have gone long ago. 
May my children fare likewise. So let's say that you start looking at this, and let's say that this were one of the very few surviving documents that we had of the Wintu. What could we tell about them? Well, the first thing we could tell about them is that they had a god, that there was a world creator, and that they would talk to the world creator. The second thing is that they felt around them the world to be animated, that they could talk to the wood, that they could talk to the rocks, that they could talk to the salmon. The next thing is that the way they conceived of this, it's not, it's, it's not that they're saying, if you are a rock, look at me. It's if you are rock, look at me. This was a way of understanding the world, not as individuals, but there was a kind of rockish consciousness. There was a salmon consciousness. There was a deer consciousness. The fact that he was talking about you who dwell on the mountains to the east, to the south, to the, and so forth and so on, meant that he was living in a valley. He was looking up at them. When he's talking about, I can no longer fetch the wood, I can no longer fetch the salmon, you get a sense of what men's work is all about. Uh, you get a sense of what's important. These are the important entities there. You get a sense of somebody comfortable in the world. You get a sense of somebody who grew up in a cradle. He talks about the cradle. You also get, there was that wonderful line, in my northward arm, in my southward arm, I am advancing in weakness. Uh, that was a wonderful old way of seeing the world, that in our culture, this is my right hand, and that's to my right, and this is my left hand, and this is to my left. That other world, does anybody know where north is? Where's, where's north? Is north up this way? Yeah, okay. So then this would be my eastern arm. And I would refer to this as my eastern arm. If I were to turn around, this arm would become my westward arm. That you don't have this egocentric way of envisioning the world that you end up having a way in which the world defines you rather than the way in which you define the world. Uh, I did this regularly. I wish I could dwell on it longer, but I, what, I did, what, I, what I think one of the keys to imaginative research is, is to absolutely dwell on, to rip up every single bit of data that comes to you, to think deeply about it, to uh, not just to accept it and not just to transfer it from one source to another source, but to really use it and to envision it and to think about it and to do and meditate on it. The other thing that I would do, uh, and uh, this in this new age is going to strike you as totally crazy, but I would take, when one of these envelopes came out, when, I, when all of these scraps of paper came raining out of the envelopes, I would then take, and I kept my walls of my study bare, and I would take them to the wall and I would begin to cluster them in clusters, and I would tape them to the wall. And I would tape them to the wall so I could see the entire entity of it all, and so that I could walk around and look at them and talk to them. Uh, the, um, uh, there, there's something about viewing one thing at a time that I find misleading, and I find unproductive, and maybe I just don't have the synapses that unite things. But taking a, something on deer hunting and seeing at it from the beginning to the end. And then the next thing that I would do was I would come in and um, this is going to sound ridiculous but it's true. I would fast before coming in. Uh, I would clear my mind and I would resolve to spend an entire morning looking at the notes. Not writing, not thinking, not doing anything, just looking at the notes and absorbing what was there. And I think that process of absorption is an amazingly interesting and wonderful process. I would look at them and I would think about them and I would have pictures, if I was hunt doing deer hunting, I would have pictures of deer, I would have pictures of meadows. I would try to imagine, I would try to imagine what it was like to be a hunter. I would talk to other hunters, I would talk to other Indians, uh, I would talk to biologists about how deer act. And I would dwell as deeply as I could on what this was. And I would dwell on it for a long time writing. If I were to write anything, it would be a scrap of paper that I would tack up to the uh, wall. And then finally, when I began writing, it was only after I had, and sometimes I would have to take a break from it. I would have to take a day off uh, and ask more questions and do more research that, I, that, that arouses. 
but, but it has to do with really thinking, I mean, how well do I know this material? If I'm going to talk about how Indians hunted deer, how confident am I that this was indeed the way it was done? Uh, that process of imagination, that process of um, fantasy, that process of putting you there is not just a way of getting at better writing, it's a way of discerning truths. Uh, I ended up using that La Perouse quote about the deer hunter uh, in its fullness. I ended up expanding on it. It fit in with other data, in with an overall picture of um, how deer hunting works, of how the mind works. Uh, it fit into a context. The passage that I read about houses has been quoted very often that all of the old histories of California Indians talk about how Indians lived in these round houses that were six feet in diameter uh, and were built in this particular way. I mean, this is one of the most, uh, along with another similar passage by Vancouver. Uh, this has been taken as a model of scholarly enterprise. If you react with it imaginatively, I don't know how many caught it, but this was totally ridiculous description. I mean, this was just a totally bizarre description that you could have 750 people living in 50 houses. Uh, that would be 15 people per house. Uh, and then if these people could live in a house that was six feet in diameter and four feet high, these people were six inches tall, uh, or there was something completely off base about this. And the fact is that, it had been, it, that it's the kind of thing that because it's in an authorized source, it gets quoted and carried on. Once you start imaginatively interacting with it all, uh, you realize that it's totally, that there, there was something wrong with this description. And I, and I suspect that he was seeing storehouses, or I suspect that he was seeing that people were sleeping outside or they were sleeping somewhere else. He was seeing something. I'm not sure what it was. But it was, an, it was the, it, they, that the imagination, <clears throat> If, that if, if, if you just accept stuff and transfer it over, you get into ridiculous statements that just get carried on. If you filter it through, your, what you know about the world, what you know about people, what you know about yourself, then uh, it, it, the, the imagination both serves as a way of developing material and it's a way of filtering out stupid material. Uh, I, I don't have very much more time, so I'll simply, um, uh, I'll, I'll take a few questions. There, there, there's a process in uh, books I've come to understand as I've grown older that there's uh, three stages to doing a book. Uh, there's the research stage. Uh, there's the writing stage. And then comes the final stage where you get out and talk about it. And that's the stage where you finally understand what in the world it was that you did. Uh, and uh, I thank you for allowing me to understand better what I've done. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Will anybody uh, break the silence with a question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, do people hear the question? No, no. Uh, no the, 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 the question was introduced by being self-serving, uh, and uh, it wasn't. It was um, uh, that we mentioned uh, that we helped start a program uh, of California Indian language apprenticeships, and do we still have, uh, do, do we offer other apprenticeships in, uh, in, in, in research in California Indian or California history stuff? Yeah, we do. We have a, uh, an intern program, and um, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hey Day Books, I, st I created this in 1974 as a publisher. We do about 25 books a year. We do a couple of events a year. Uh, we um, have, currently we have about eight of our books traveling as museum shows. Uh, it's on the website at www.heydaybooks.com. Uh, for me, it is, I, I characterize my life as a publisher, that I come in in the morning and I step into a stream of beauty. 
uh, that the amount of that when you're that the, the the thing about publishing, the thing about writing. I don't know if anybody here is going is considering the life of publishing or writing or scholarship. Uh, but as a publisher, people bring you the best of their work. I mean, they bring you stuff that is the most beautiful that they know how to do, the stuff that they believe in the most. Uh, we deal in poetry, we deal in art, we deal in people's best thoughts, we shape them into a book. And I've often characterized my life as a publisher as I just come in and I look at that river of beauty and my whole skill is I dip a ladle into it and pull out something once in a while and call it a book. Uh, and it's been a wonderful thing, people that work there. And um, uh, some books come through that um, just transform the place, that everybody that works on them, I mean, everybody that is part of them uh, is changed by what happens. Thank you. Yeah. God, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what popped into my mind was the most ridiculous thing. I mean, uh, because I've got the most ridiculous mind. Uh, the most ridiculous, th you, you, you know what I think it may have been? Uh, back in the 60s, everybody had Volkswagens. Uh, and we had a Volkswagen bus. And there was a guy named John Muir, not uh, the naturalist John Muir, but uh, a, a VW mechanic who lived in Santa Fe, who used to walk around with a parrot on his shoulder and parrot droppings down his shirt. Uh, and he wrote a book, VW Repair for the Complete Idiot. Uh, and it was the most wonderful book for those of us that were just breaking loose from an urban background where you didn't know how to do anything. I mean, this was a book for the complete idiot. I mean, it talked about how you open the uh, hood, or the, 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 the back gate, and you look in, and there's a kind of round thingy off to the left. Uh, and on that round thingy, there's a squarish bolt. Uh, and you take and you twist that squarish bolt, and you do this and you do that. And the reason that it was uh, probably the most influential book that I ever read was that it taught me that you could do things. And it got me into publishing that I, that, that, that I figured that if I could actually pull a VW apart and actually get the thing together and it actually would run for a few days, uh, we had low standards back then, uh, that I could probably set, could probably design, and I could probably do other things. And it was this sense that you could do stuff in the world, that you didn't have to depend on others, that you could be self-sufficient, that I think probably was the most... Um, uh, I, I, mean, I think that, in, in, in an odd way, I mean, I've got a literary background, I've read the classics. I mean, I think that this was the book that um, probably influenced me the most. So, the, the book that is uh, currently influencing me the most uh, is a book that we just published. Uh, the problem with being a publisher is you know your own books much better than anything else. Uh, and. Um, it was a book that there's been this guy who's been obsessed with streets in Los Angeles named after saints. Uh, and he goes and he researches the street and who lives on the street and the history of the street and why the street was named after a saint. He researches the life of the saint and then he finds miraculous coincidence how the people on the street are living out the lives of the saints. And it is the most imaginative and wonderful, it, it, it's somehow or other these lives of the saints, and I'm not Christian, uh, the, I grew up in a Jewish world, uh, so I come at it from the outside. Uh, but these lives of the saints were for Western civilization, the oldest stories. I mean, these were the stories that nourished our belief, the story that, that, that taught us how to be great people, that taught us what love and suffering and sacrifice and devotion and forgiveness were all about. Uh, and he brings these these stories back into current usage and intermingles them with the current life of people. And I think that's what I love. I love, I, I love that intermingling of, of knowledge and experience and spirit and culture and people of today. Yeah. Yes. But is, are there times when this active involvement can lead you astray? Like, you, do you get what I'm saying? 
No, I hear what you're saying. I mean, that, and that question was a good one, that I'm uh, advocating a synthesis of imaginative involvement in scholarship. Uh, and uh, are there times when imaginative uh, involvement can lead you astray? It depends where your imagination is rooted. Uh, if your imagination is rooted in delusion, uh, then uh, you're going to be led astray, if that's what you're calling imagination. <laughs> Uh, if your imagination is rooted in a broad realm of arts and history and, uh, uh, and if it's a sound imagination, if it's a playful imagination, and if you've got the intelligence to doubt it, uh, if what you're doing is, uh, it, 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 I think imagination is different from propaganda. Imagination, it can, and, I, and I think that it, I think we've been all taught to leave our emotions behind when we do research. We've all been taught to leave our, that, that, that it, it's become a, a kind of branch of the sciences. Uh, it always was, until recently, a branch of the arts. Uh, historians were artists. Gibbon was, in the fall of the Roman Empire, was a superb stylist. I mean, th th that could have been a novel. Uh, and I think that, once again, um, as long as you're honest about how you've used your imagination, as long as, you, as long as the imagination is sound and as long as you say, this is what I think it was, or this is what, how it might have been, or this is what I, um, this is what I imagine, I mean, as, long as, you're, as, as long as you're true to your source, then I think it can be used well. But it's a good warning. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very good warning. Yes, that's right. It's partly getting more cues. It's partly um, using the material better. Uh, it's, it, it, it's learning to ask better questions. Uh, that um, a question as to, um, in, instead, of just, instead of just taking it, it, it's, it's, the di it's the difference between doing a, a work of art, uh, uh, an original work of art, and doing a collage. And a lot of research ends up as collage. You just take facts and you put them into some kind of an order and stuff like that, rather than putting them through that process where you're synthesizing them and um, uh, you, 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 you're using them better. You're, co you're, you're crossing over better. Uh, it's tricky ground. It's tricky ground, and um, it's 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 also good. They're, they're, it's also good to have friends uh, that uh, are knowledgeable. That I think that uh, when I wrote that book and when I've written every book, there's when I there, there's been people that have been looking over my shoulder, and either they've been looking over my shoulder literally, or they've been looking over my shoulder imaginatively. And when I wrote that book, there was a whole gallery of people behind my shoulder. There were especially Indians, there were anthropologists, there were um, uh, historians, there were people to be pleased. And I just made certain that I was responsive to all of them. We've done a number of anthologies uh, on controversial subjects. And the rule of doing those anthologies is not that you can't have a principled stance, not that you can't make a moral statement, but that everybody's viewpoint has to be represented fairly. Uh, in the end, you can disagree, but you cannot just set up straw men and knock them down. That you have to give anybody that reads what you said about them is going to have to recognize that this is indeed uh, as good as it could be said. Uh, and as long as you have that multiplicity, I, th I, th I think the imagination runs into trouble when it becomes too when it, when it becomes too narrow. I think that if it's more broadly based, then it's there's a kind of safeguard in it. It's a wonderful question. Any other more or even less wonderful questions? <laughs> yeah. Um, in the Ohlone Way, there's a chapter that talks about uh, what it was like uh, when when the Ohlone would, would actually fight or, you know, uh, have these little wars, which wasn't really often, but how, like, maybe one person from another tribe lived 
you know, would, would uh, get killed and then the battle would be over and then they would like repay the other, the other village? Yeah. Uh, what, was, what was it like focusing on something like that, uh, especially when thinking about uh, modern warfare or, or European uh, idea of, of warfare? And, I mean, were you able to step inside that, that scene? What you know, what 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 that there, 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 there was something that was uh, guiding me on that one, and it was um, a full statement. There was an early visitor to California, Joaquin Miller, uh, and he was a writer. And when he was 17 years old, he came down from Oregon, uh, and he came down toward Mount Shasta, uh, and he was going for the gold fields, for the northern gold fields. Uh, and he wrote, when he came down to Mount Shasta, by the way, he wrote the most beautiful line in California literature. And he just describes Mount Shasta as sudden, and that lonely as God and white as a winter moon, Mount Shasta starts up sudden and solitary from the great dark forests of California. But he was describing Indians that he lived among. And what he said about them was this most amazing statement because he was describing them before anthropologists or politically correct people or Others taught us how to describe Indians. And he said that when he met these people, they were, uh, he, that he met them before they were corrupted by Western civilization. They were the most gracious, elegant, noble, generous, gentle people he has ever met. They were also the most violent. He has no idea how these two qualities can exist in the same person. I'm merely telling you what I'm seeing, is what he said. And it was this business of, um, how you reconcile the fact that these were tribes that were continually squabbling, they were continually quarreling, uh, that uh, the, 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 the gentleness and the violence don't seem to be on the same line. I mean, it's, it's not like they're opposites, like they exist in different systems. Uh, and it was, the, and the question was not, I mean, I think the, th the conclusion that I had is that we are inherently, that there's something in the human behavior that leads us to fight. There's something in the human behavior that leads us to form small groups and hate other small groups, or form large groups and hate other large groups. It's, it, it, it's almost like biologically inherent. And this is the curse of being a human, is uh, the, the, this need to do so. The wisdom of that culture wasn't that they avoided it, that they had institutions that limited it that they could act it out, that they could have it the more theater than anything else, that there were institutions that if you killed somebody, you had to, there were spiritual institutions, that if you killed somebody, you had to make recompense to the family. And therefore, it became expensive to kill people. Uh, so you didn't want to kill too many people. You wanted to kill enough people so that you could say that you won. But you didn't want to kill too many people, because otherwise you'd go broke. Uh, and, 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 the, and it was the need, and, 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 and this was actually, this is a wonderful question because it, it was in response to the Vietnam Wars and it was in response to many of my friends who are pacifists uh, that you cannot ban violence as, as far as I'm concerned, that you cannot ban warfare. What you can do is institute the, the cultural mechanisms for limiting it for, avoid, for, 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 for diminishing its, uh, the damage that it does. Okay, thank you.